The University of Arizona faces a $177 million budget shortfall. Its president tells us why he thinks he's the best person to clean up this financial mess. The Department of Justice could release the results of an investigation into police practices in Phoenix at any moment, but the city is not sitting idle. And crews began an annual canal cleanup in Metro Phoenix. It's become a fishy affair. Welcome to The Briefing, your weekly debrief of top news by the Arizona Republic and AZ Central. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Rafael Carranza. Here are the top three things you need to know this week. It's been nearly 14 years since the Arizona legislature passed SB 1070, the last anti-immigrant bill signed into law. This session, Republican lawmakers holding single-seat majorities in both chambers are poised to pass several bills, mostly along party lines. The Arizona Invasion Act would make crossing the Arizona border in between official ports a state crime. It's a replica of a Texas bill signed into law, but is currently held up in court from taking effect. Another bill, HCR 2060, would require city, state, and other government agencies to use E-Verify to make sure recipients are in the country legally in order to access services. Critics dub these bills as SB 1070 2.0, Governor Katie Hobbs signaled her opposition to the bills, but concurrent resolutions don't need a governor's signature, and if passed, HCR 2060 would be sent to voters on the 2024 ballot. Three cities in the Southwest Valley are cracking down on unlicensed sober living homes, a system caught up in a Medicaid fraud scandal that has cost taxpayers at least $2 billion so far. Officials in Avondale, Buckeye, and Goodyear have relied on codes to go after unlicensed facilities, but state laws require exact locations to be kept secret, and many more are not licensed to the state. The Arizona Attorney General has gone after sober living homes, accusing them of targeting Native Americans, kidnapping some off the streets, and taking them to homes in Metro Phoenix. They then charged the state Medicaid millions of dollars for services they never provided. A decision by the Maricopa County attorney Rachel Mitchell to offer a plea deal to the former chief of Arizona's prisons that would avoid jail time is coming under greater scrutiny. Body cam footage shows a drunken Charles Ryan engaging in an hours-long standoff in his Tempe home in January 2022. Tempe police evacuated neighboring homes and called in the SWAT team because they said Ryan had a weapon. Two police officers say, and the footage shows, that Ryan pointed the gun at them. They submitted letters to a judge asking for a harsher punishment. Mitchell said she signed off on the plea deal because he was too drunk to know what he was doing. The judge sentenced Ryan to two years probation. The University of Arizona is facing a $177 million budget shortfall and its plan to get out of it is raising lots of questions. The U of A administrator said the financial mess was years in the making. 61 of the university's 81 budget units Key among them, the athletics department, have overspent this year. The plan to stabilize the UA budget could take up to three years. The school hired the executive director from the Arizona Board of Regents to lead this effort, but the pushback from the decision forced John Arnold, the director, to temporarily step down from the board. Fred Duvall also stepped down as chair of the Board of Regents over his response to the crisis. Arizona Governor Katie Hobbs is among the top critics of the University of Arizona's plans to tackle the budget shortfall, saying it's headed in the wrong direction. UA President Robert Robbins sat down with education reporter Helen Rummel to talk about why he should stay on the job. So President Robbins, you have frequently um, talked about the financial crisis that was found by ABOR um, in November of last year and said that you need to find um, the causes first. And so can you walk us through what some of the causes for the situation the university is in now? One is that uh, our system that we've been operating on in terms of uh, resource allocations um, it has been decentralized and we're seeking as part of the solution to the problems that we found to more centralize and put proper controls on the, uh, on the spending. Our investment in uh, merit aid, to, particularly to out-of-state students, uh, was something that I think uh, we invested in. We've had great success, but we, we need to not invest as much of that merit aid money for out-of-state students. And then, of course, there's athletics and the, um, the convergence of all the factors that are going on in college athletics that uh, contributed. Uh, those are the, the sort of the three big areas that I look at. What are some things that you can guarantee will not be happening? Um, just so students and faculty are aware going forward. Yeah, so we're going to continue to invest in our core mission, which is the success of our students, and we're going to invest in our faculty and staff, particularly around our scholarship and research 
uh, missions. Uh, we'll continue to have our service mission as the land grant university in the state. Uh, so that, that uh, will not be touched. Uh, there will be no furloughs. We're going to honor uh, uh, all the commitments we've made to students so far. So we had a four year guarantee plan uh, that we'll be phasing out. Uh, as well as reducing the merit aid, but all of the students that we've committed to, we won't take those things away. We're not gonna affect any retirement benefits for any of our faculty or our staff. Thank you for joining us, President Robbins, um, and we appreciate your time. The Arizona Board of Regents, the supervisory board that oversees the three state universities, is also taking heat from the financial crisis at the University of Arizona. As investigative reporter Hannah Dreyfus tells us, they're also under the microscope for okaying the U of A's purchase of a troubled online school. In 2020, the University of Arizona purchased then Ashford University, formerly a for-profit school with about 35,000 students. The acquisition promised to increase student diversity and to bring in more revenue, but nearly four years later, U of A officials admit it won't turn a profit until at least 2025. Now, administrators must explain why they purchased Ashford, despite a known troubled history that includes multiple lawsuits accusing the school of misleading students about costs and the value of their degrees. The acquisition, coupled with the budget shortfall, has drawn anger from Arizona students and faculty over a perceived lack of oversight and conflicts of interest. The administration clearly knows how to spend money, but they don't know how to manage money. That anger has also been directed at the Board of Regents, the public body appointed to oversee higher education in Arizona. At the latest board meeting, Regents went after university faculty for criticizing them and raising concerns about potential conflicts of interest. I frankly now doubt the accuracy and credibility of any one of the many accusations that are being made against the university and the president. That earned a powerful rebuke from Governor Katie Hobbs, who chastised the board calling their behavior appalling and unacceptable. Hobbs also criticized the board's oversight of the Ashford acquisition and the mixed messages Regents officials have been giving the media and the public. The board's report said they had vetted the process, contradicting what school administrators told the Arizona Republic just days before. They said they had not independently vetted the deal, even though they were aware of Ashford's troubled history with using fraudulent marketing tactics to boost enrollment numbers. Reporting for the briefing, I'm Hannah Dreyfus, investigative reporter with the Arizona Republic. Governor Hobbs is expected to meet with the Board of Regents later this week to discuss the U of A's budget crisis. You can find Helen and Hannah's full reporting on azcentral.com. Coming up in just a bit, the city of Phoenix is lashing out at a DOJ report, even though it hasn't been published yet. The Phoenix Police Department is waiting on the results on an investigation by the Department of Justice to find out whether their police practices also included constitutional violations. Criminal justice reporter Miguel Torres and Phoenix City Hall reporter Taylor Seeley have been tracking this investigation so far. So let's start with you, Miguel. What led to this DOJ investigation? So unlike in other places that the DOJ has started an investigation, they haven't really said that there's been one incident. They haven't really pointed to any incidents, really. But experts agree that there's been incident after incident, controversy after controversy in the Phoenix Department that may have led to all of this. So not one thing, but a bunch of things, right? You can go back to 2018 when the Phoenix Police Department led the country in police shootings. You can go back to 2020 during the national protests after the killing of George Floyd. There were some gang charges at that time. Those charges were dis dismissed, ending in reprimands within the Phoenix Police Department, within our county attorney's office. Uh, all of these things kind of built up to this idea of possible constitutional violations. And so what has been the police department's response so far? And also, what has the community said about that? Uh, Interim Police Chief Sullivan was hired in 2021. He was coming out of Baltimore as the compliance commissioner for the department, basically working with the OGA there to meet all the requirements that they needed to meet in their own consent decree. So he's come to Phoenix, started a lot of reforms, a lot of different trainings, different units. Uh, in January, the department released a reforms report, and in it, they detail all of these things. So they, they're saying, we're reforming ourselves, we're assessing ourselves, we don't need a DOJ necessarily to tell us how to reform. But the community has had different responses. At public meetings, some community members are really asking, would any of the reforms have been made if the DOJ didn't start an investigation? Other community members feel like the DOJ has no business telling the city how to manage its department. 
Okay, Taylor, now you've been following the City of Phoenix response to this investigation. What have they said so far? City Hall's response has been somewhat scattered, but I think overwhelmingly what has been surprising is the pushback that we've seen. Pretty early on, we saw council members come out after some residents had been sort of lobbying the council, saying, we don't like the DOJ. We trust our police department. They're, look, they're already reforming. So make sure that whatever you do when this investigation concludes, you push back. And so after you saw that residential lobbying, you actually saw some council members really push back in public meetings saying, we do need evidence. We don't want to go blindly into a consent decree. They take a long time. They're very expensive. And that's why council members are pushing back and saying, you know, maybe we want to actually litigate. Maybe we don't want to agree to this if that's what the DOJ wants. And so what does the timeline look like? Do we know when this investigation will come out? In November, the De Department of Justice had interviewed City Manager Jeff Barton and Interim Police Chief Michael Sullivan. And I think that prompted some concerns in the area about, oh no, this findings report is going to come out soon. We better start doing our lobbying. We don't really know. So we're all just waiting. For more information about the DOJ investigation into the Phoenix Police Department, be, please be sure to check out Miguel and Taylor's work at azcentral.com. My name is Sean Holstead. I'm the city and development editor for the Arizona Republic. You've seen newsletters in, in the past, but what we're doing now is we're taking uh, fresh material, we're curating it. I compile that information, package it up, send it off in an email to you, so it's nice and easy for the reader. If you missed the news, if you didn't see it in AZ Central, or you didn't get the paper, this is your way to find to get caught up in what's going on in your part. Welcome back to The Briefing. A three-month process to clean the canals that carry drinking water to two million people in the Phoenix metro just wrapped up. Crews with the Salt River Project work to drain the canals, clear up debris, and repair any damage along the canal walls. Crews then stock the canals with Amur fish, a species native to China that will do another vital type of maintenance for the rest of the year. Fishing or removing these fish is illegal. Canal cleanup across the Phoenix metro area takes place during the winter because there is less demand for water used for agriculture. March is finally here, and with it comes the desert wildflowers. So, for this week's Sunspot, we're telling you some of the best spots so you can get out there and see them up close. The most reliable areas for wildflowers includes Picacho Peak, Bartlett Lake, and the Superstition Mountains east of Phoenix. Within the city, hit up the regional parks like Cave Creek, the White Tanks, or even South Mountain. Thank you so much for joining us on The Briefing, your weekly debrief of top news by the Arizona Republic and AZ Central. We'll see you next time. Have a great week.